Tacoma, Washington. When you think about Tacoma, you might think about the underbelly of Seattle. Some think of the Tacoma Dome, the Emerald Queen Casino, and Stadium High School, where the movie 10 Things I Hate About You was filmed. But as Tacomans, when we think about Tacoma, we think about the culture, the waterfront, and the amazing view of Mount Rainier. It's the place that shaped us to be who we are today. But what a lot of people don't think about when it comes to Tacoma is the incredible black history under its belt. Well, you guessed it. In today's episode, we've got you covered. We're going to introduce you to a few hometown heroes that put Tacoma on the map and paved the way for so many people, young and old, to be able to thrive in the bustling and growing scene of what Tacoma is today. Let's get into it. All right, so before we did anything, we had to figure out who we wanted to highlight. Through our research, we found that there are several movers and shakers that have been making history in our own backyard for over 150 years, and it's still happening today. So we picked a few individuals and groups whose accomplishments spoke to us, did our research, sat down, spoke with the subject matter experts, and put together today's episode. The first person we'll be highlighting today is a man who dedicated his life's work to the fair treatment and civil rights of not only African Americans, but Native Americans as well. Judge Jack Tanner. Born and raised in Tacoma, Washington in the 1930s, Judge Tanner faced discrimination as a young man due to the color of his skin. He was a talented baseball player, but due to segregation at the time, he opted into enlisting in the army in 1943, where he was placed in an all black unit. After his time serving in the army, Judge Tanner went on to graduate from the College of Puget Sound, which is now known as the University of Puget Sound, and furthered his education at the University of Washington to study law, where he was the only African-American student in the program. In 1955, he passed the state bar and within a few years opened his own criminal defense law practice in downtown Tacoma. By 1957, he was an officer in the local NAACP chapter and was a member of the national board until 1965. While serving on the board, he marched for housing inequality in Kennewick, advised then President John F. Kennedy on drafting the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and strongly supported Native American fishing rights. In 1968, Judge Tanner was a founding member in the Lauren Miller Bar Association, which is the largest organization of African American attorneys in the United States. By 1978, President Jimmy Carter nominated him to the federal bench where he was the first African American to serve as a federal district court judge in the Pacific Northwest. Judge Tanner was so passionate about his work that he chose not to retire in the 1980s and chose to remain on the bench until another African American judge would be able to take his place. In 2018, Marine Park on the waterfront was renamed Judge Jack Tanner Park in honor of Judge Tanner and his legacy of serving the community for decades. Pierce County, the where we live, had no parks in all of Pierce County named for an African-American man or woman. So I say, wait a minute, we need to have a park named after uh, a black person. And that's how Judge Tanner got uh, involved as far as having a park. Judge Tanner was a man of, of all kinds of things. He ran for the governor of the state of Washington. He was also the, the uh, lead for uh, Scoop Jackson, who ran for the president of the United States. He was known for his advocacy for men and women. He had two major decisions that he was involved in. Judge Tanner um, was the judge that uh, got the equal pay for equal work for women. It was over overturned by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. He was very instrumental as far as uh, a person that was involved in the spirit and in, uh, institutions of racism and things like that. that uh, we were involved in at that time. And so when I nominated Judge Tanner for the uh, renaming of a park, I said Judge Tanner would be perfect. He's a person that lived here and worked here and lived here all of his life, died here, and he deserves to have his name on a, on a park. The next person we will be highlighting is a noteworthy activist and educator who in the 1970s saw the lack of opportunity for accessible higher education in the black community. As a result, she built a college curriculum and campus right from her own home in Tacoma's Hilltop neighborhood, Dr. Maxine Mims. 
Dr. Mims moved to Seattle in 1953 after her husband secured a job at Boeing Airplane Company. She worked as a teacher and developed her career as an educator in various school districts in the state until the 1970s. In the 1970s, she discovered the barriers that made it difficult for African-American students in the Hilltop area to complete higher education. After hearing the concerns of students taking many years to graduate with an associate's degree, Dr. Mims decided to create her own adult education program. Determined to get the ball rolling on this quest, Dr. Mims started teaching classes from her own home in Tacoma's Hilltop neighborhood. By 1975, enrollment grew to 10 students and classes moved to a community center. Five years later, enrollment soared to 80 students. As enrollment and staff members continued to expand, so did the locations where classes were being offered. In 1984, the college officially became the Tacoma branch of Evergreen State College, where Dr. Mims became the first director of the campus. After changing a few locations again due to the growing number of students and staff, in 2001, the program found its permanent home on 6th Avenue in Tacoma. Today, enrollment is over 200 students annually and has continued to impact many students, especially adult African Americans. I was in a place called Brown Star Grill and there were two women sitting in there discussing new colleges and they were students at TCC and they had been in the TCC program for years and years and years, I guess, repeating English, repeating math. And they were talking about uh, how hard it was on them as older women trying to have a family and all those kind of complex things. And I got up and went around to the other side and asked what could I do to make their lives a little bit easier. And they began to lay out some challenges of the black and brown, at that time, the black community, the Hilltop community. And I started, I said if they would meet me in my house, I would get their, help them get their degrees. And my whole concept was designing an educational system that would permit access. Academic courses were interdisciplinary. We were together. Everything that you had at traditional schools, we had, but they were all integrated. Everything was integrated. So to solve a problem, you could have five different disciplines working on that one problem, which was very advanced at that time. We've always ignored the urban areas. So I wanted one right there where people could walk, skate, catch a bus, be dropped off. That's what I wanted to see for black people. And last but not least, we've got Nettie Asbury a noted black leader in Tacoma, who is considered to be the first African-American woman to receive a doctoral degree in the U.S. Asbury was born on July 15, 1865 in Leavenworth, Kansas. This is 1865, so out of her other five siblings, Nettie Asbury was the only child who was born free. At age eight, she began studying piano, and this interest in music only grew as she aged. This led her to enroll and graduate with her Doctorate of Music from Kansas Conservatory of Music and Elocution on June 12, 1883. That's right, a month before her 18th birthday, Nettie Asbury likely became the first African-American woman to earn a doctoral degree. Over the years, she taught and performed in choirs in Kansas and Colorado. In 1893, when Asbury was just 28 years old, she moved and remained in Tacoma for the next 75 years. In that time, she became one of the founding members of the Tacoma NAACP, established the Tacoma City Association of Colored Women's Club, fought segregation in Tacoma, and still found time to use that PhD to teach children music and direct choirs. All in all, it's fair to say that Nettie Asbury had quite an impactful 103 years on this planet. While we weren't able to secure any interviews for Nettie, it's worth mentioning that the Tacoma City Association of Colored Women's Clubs is looking to buy Nettie Asbury's home in the near future. According to a Tacoma News Tribune article, while plans have yet to be formalized, the Tacoma CWC has visions of renovating Asbury's music room, creating a black history library, an African American museum, and a hilltop community event space. Now that we've covered three individuals that have made an impact in the community, let's talk about two organizations that have impacted the black community in a major way. Up First is an organization that has been meeting every Saturday for the last five decades to discuss topics in the black community. It is well known, well respected, and holds a lot of weight in not only Tacoma's black community, but in Tacoma in general. 
It's none other than the Black Collective. The Black Collective was developed in the 1970s after the Mother's Day riot in 1969. If you're not familiar with the Mother's Day riot, believe it or not, it was Tacoma's very own race riot between the police department and Tacoma's black citizens on the hilltop. The brawl lasted all night and is often referred to as a turning point in Tacoma's civil rights. After the riot, black community leaders such as Thomas Dixon, who was the executive director of the Tacoma Urban League, Harold Moss, then a leader in the Tacoma chapter of the NAACP, and a few others took a stand to stop the violence. They met and negotiated with the city council to have black representation on the police force and improving services on the hilltop. Since then, black leaders as well as other community members have met every Saturday morning to discuss economics, education, politics, social justice, and health concerns within the local black community. In 2008, one of the founding members of the Black Collective and Tacoma's first black mayor, Harold Moss, said, the great strength endurance and influence in the black collective is not its structure or lack thereof but it is in the autonomy and commitment to the mission of empowering and bettering conditions of the black community the black collective from my perspective the black collective's goal is to enrich and improve the black community the black collective's goal is to focus on areas like we have an economic committee we have an education committee we focus on health care for the the entire pandemic, we spent the first 15 minutes of the pandemic talking about COVID-19. There was nobody on the collective call that did not understand COVID-19 and didn't have access to a medical physician that could ask, answer different questions about the virus or the vaccine. Ultimately, the collective's goal is to, to improve the condition of the black community. If you've done your fair share of studying black history, you've more than likely have come across learning about the Black Panther Party. While the founding members organized the first chapter of the party in Oakland, what most people don't know is that the first chapter to organize outside of Oakland was right in our own neighboring city of Seattle, Washington. We had the honor and the privilege to meet and talk about the Black Panther Party Seattle chapter with the co-founder and field marshal, Elmer Dixon. He let us know firsthand how it really went down in the 1960s. The Black Panther Party was a, a political party that represented the needs of black people that, was, that were not being represented. Uh, we weren't getting representation in Washington, D.C. Uh, from our so-called elected officials because they're far away making big salaries. Uh, we wanted a political party that was that could see eye level with the community, see eye level with the common person, the common man, the common woman, and, and understand what their needs were and deliver those needs so that people could have control over uh, the institutions within their community schools, medical clinics, ability to have jobs, the ability to feed their families, uh, you know, the basic need that people had in order to live a decent life. That's what the Black Panther Party was, was a political party to represent the needs of the black community. And we did that in coalition with other, with other groups, with other communities. We had coalitions in the white community, in the Asian community, in the Native American community. So we weren't uh, about separating we were about organizing together. In fact, the very first Rainbow Coalition was started by Fred Hampton, not by Jesse Jackson, but by Fred Hampton. That's why they murdered Fred Hampton. And because we did these things and we dared to stand up against a racist government, they attacked us. They tried to murder us in our sleep, which is why, which is why we had to arm and defend ourselves so that we could survive, so we could continue to work in the, in the community. So if you're going to, if you're going to do something right, you know, you have to make a full commitment. You can't be in there halfway. You got to be committed. And the Black Panther Party was committed. It was the first time that someone had stood in the face of racist oppression with a gun in our hands because they had guns in theirs and said, we're not going to let you kill us. We're not going to let you brutalize us. We're not going to let you lynch us anymore. We're not going to let you burn down our communities like you did Black Wall Street. We're going to fight back and defend ourselves. Soaking up game for Mr. Dixon was an absolute privilege, and we could only imagine what it really looked like from an outsider looking in. We sat down with two men in the community who were there as children to see firsthand what the Black Panther Party looked like to the black community. I remember being a young man and getting haircuts, right? <laughs> and when the Black Panther Party came out, they had the froze, right? And everybody wanted to have afros. Like everybody wanted to be dressed in black. Um, and so I, that was my first image of them. That's what I liked. That's what drew me to those guys. And then again, as they as I got older 
and sort of seeing some of the things they were doing in the community, it just made me, you know, enamored to them even more. They wasn't no joke. I mean, they were serious about what they were doing. They had a mission. And that mission was to keep us safe. They put their life, uh, you know, at stake to keep us safe. So they look like, they look, yeah, I can see why people was intimidated by them because they were black and they were proud. And when you see it, it's one of the most beautiful things you ever see. I'm, I'm so privileged myself as a black man to be able to experience that in my people. Listening to people that I've only read about in books and seen in documentaries was truly a once in a lifetime experience. But that's not all that we have for you today. As you know, history is continuously being made. And we got to speak with someone who's the president of the Tacoma Urban League and the first black senator in Washington state in 10 years. Washington State Senator Tawana Nobles. As someone who is actively writing their chapter um, in history here in Tacoma, I know that I have major responsibilities. I know that it is important for me to be a positive role model, for me to walk the walk and talk the talk. I have a responsibility to be honest, to be true, to make sure that I understand, you know, as we said around Juneteenth, that until everyone is free, none of us are free. And that when, you know, the next person is doing well, then I'm able to do well. But we are, we are in this together. And it's a major responsibility. Some of it, you know, I know I didn't necessarily ask for, but I lean into it, I embrace it. And as I continue to establish myself and just become whoever it is that I am destined to become, I wanna make sure that I am consistently and persistently bringing others with me. My greatest message to young people is that the best is yet to come. If I would have given up at any moment in my life, if I would have given up because I was abused, if I would have given up because I was homeless or experiencing homelessness, if I was, when I was experiencing the foster care system, when I became you know, an early parent, if I didn't have that voice in me telling me that the best is yet to come, there is no way that I would be here. And so I encourage young people, no matter what they're experiencing, no matter what the naysayers you know, are, are offering as commentary, to keep in mind that tomorrow is a new day. There's always another opportunity to start over, to start fresh, and the best is simply yet to come. So there you have it. That's three individuals and two groups who have been instrumental in shaping black history in Tacoma, and a senator who is still writing her chapter in the history books today. One thing to note is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Tacoma's Black History runs deep, and we hope that this short video inspires you to dig a little deeper and see what trailblazers laid the foundation for the past that you're walking on today. And that's our takeaway. Research local Black history in your area. You'll be surprised what you find. Find strength in those stories and carry that strength into tomorrow. Before we dip, thank you Tacoma Art Museum for sponsoring this video. Your contribution and also your commission of having this be the episode that we do means so much. Number two, thank you Alma Mater for letting us use your beautiful space. All right, y'all, we're out of here. We'll see y'all next time.